All of questions from last time was, so how is this now with this running coupling constant? Uh, what does actually high energy and low energy imply and where, where, does, where do high energies enter and where do low energies enter? I mean, I just try to interpret your question now. Um, for example, in the sense, um, I said, well, one can see quarks, but one cannot cut them out. But, but if I hit very hard on a, on a proton, uh, I mean, it is intuitive that I can kick out a quark, and this is a hit, hitting very hard is a high energy transfer. So there, the coupling should be small. That I should it should be possible to kick it out. But if it's kicked out, why does it then not reach the detector? What's happening then? Where does then the low energy aspect of confinement come in? So I thought um, I give you a little picture of a high energy reaction. Um, which actually consists of two parts, or maybe even three, um, and then that you get a better feeling which part of a high energy reaction is in fact high energy, and which part of a high energy uh, reaction actually involves low energies again. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, this is what the whole thing will be about reactions. And from now on, when I talk about reactions, I mainly have in mind the strong interaction. Well, you will see in a moment I involve electromagnetic interactions too, but reactions including hadrons or including quarks. Um, so reactions at high energies. So in principle, the logic is um, um, so the logic is high energies. Therefore, this effective coupling strength, which one calls alpha s, is small, and therefore. Um, transfer now a lot of energy to a system which consists out of quarks and then the question is can these quarks get away from each other to some extent and the logic is well their interaction between the quarks is goes with alpha s and if alpha s is small the quarks are nearly like free particles so it should be possible that they that they gain some distance from each other if I hit one of the quarks okay so, if alpha s is small, this would imply that the quarks... Uh, this noise we always thought is a howling cat in the wall. Um, I don't know, this is, this is here for, for uh, years now, <laughs> and it's only here. Uh, yeah, maybe someone finds finally the cat. Um, so, quarks in a hadron, or in the hadron... Um, <coughs> behave like, well, let me specify that a little, nearly free particles. <coughs> and now comes the but. single quarks well do not reach the detector this is a first of all an experimental finding <coughs> and well we do not fully understand where this comes from but at least we have already a name for it this is confinement
qualitative picture on that and also give you an idea what can be calculated and what cannot be calculated but actually can be parameterized. Okay, we come to that now. Um, <clears throat> so the issue is that a high energy reaction consists out of two parts. <coughs> One is actually the truly high energy reaction. has high resolution, in other words, we really see that there are quarks there. So we see this on the most microscopic level which we um, have found um, on the level of the elementary particles. So in this reaction, the reaction partners are quarks. and possibly gluons. I will come to that at the end of, uh, well, of what I'm telling you. <coughs> um, and, well, these guys, since this is a high energy reaction, we believe we can use perturbative QCD uh, to deal with that. Um, or in other words, we know their interactions. We know how to deal with this sub-part of the reaction. So these guys, these reaction partners, they behave um, according to QCD perturbation theory. This was one of the tools which I had in the first meeting uh, at high energies, this is the approximation scheme to full QCD which one can use and uh, it is a, a power expansion in this alpha S which is named up there um, and one can arbitrarily increase the accuracy of the prediction by calculating higher and higher powers in this alpha S. So it's according to QCD perturbation theory. And in, uh, well, at right now in the lectures, in the lecture notes, we are in chapter one and chapter two. This will become clearer how to do that in practice with Feynman rules and so on. <coughs> okay, so this is the first part. And then comes the second part, um, which is a low energy process.
But, so I add now something here which I only will explain later on. This part is typically process independent. And if something is process independent, this means I can measure it once at one process and use the results for another process. Because it's process independent, it does not matter exactly which process I'm looking at. Um, Two examples. The first example is actually the one where we uh, get the most precise information about high energy QCD. And this is if we use something which we completely understand, and this is in this case an electron, and we shoot it on something which we want to study, and this is a proton. If we shoot something which we completely understand on something which we completely understand, uh, then hopefully our theory is good enough just to tell us what is the result. Okay, fine, and in that way one tests theories. On the other hand, if one wants to explore something new, one ideally uses something which one already understands and probes a thing which one wants to study. And this is what we do now. Um, so we do not shoot two things which we don't understand onto each other, uh, but one of them is basically our, our way of, uh, of diagnosis for the, for the process and for the other object. Um, so this one calls deep inelastic scattering. <coughs> and a reaction is an electron and a proton going to an electron and whatever. So this whatever is completely arbitrary. What one tries to get information from is basically the scattering angle of this electron. So from this scattering angle, one basically just measures where does this electron end up. And from that one tries to learn something what happened in, in this part here. <coughs> you will see in a moment why this here is arbitrary. So this x is not a single particle but anything. So one looks at reactions and adds up all events which contain this one electron and anything hadronic. <coughs> um, so in that sense, I mean, this is very, very similar to an electron microscope. In an electron microscope, also the only thing which actually your microscope is measuring in the end is, is the scattered electron. And from that you try to deduce information on what you have seen. Um, so what one does in practice is... Uh, so collide um, E minus with the proton. Um, and measure scattered electron. Well, we want to transfer a lot of energy. Otherwise, uh, how I started out would be wrong. We talk about high energy reactions. If the electron transfers a lot of energy to the proton, um, it's scattered back. Okay, if it would scatter forward, if, if, if the electron would not be disturbed very much, it does not transfer a lot of energy to the, to the rest of my, of my system. So I actually I measure scattered electrons at backward angles. I measure them at different angles. I mean, I really want to know the differential distribution. 
Um, but I focus on the backward angles because then I'm sure a lot of energy has been transferred. So um, I measure them at backward angles. Um, and in that way I, assure, I ensure that it's really a high energy reaction. <coughs> okay, and now finally comes a little figure how the whole thing looks like. Okay, my timeline runs from left to right, so what, whatever is uh, starts here is my initial state, this here is an electron. Now what's actually happening is, I mean the electron does not strongly interact, the electron exchanges a virtual photon with the rest, so it's a kind of like a Coulomb interaction but uh, relativistic. Um, one draws that by a Feynman diagram and uh, how to deal with Feynman diagrams we will learn later on. Um, so take this now as a sketch of the reaction, not necessarily as a means how to calculate that. And this photon meets now one of the quarks and the quarks, so let me picture that at three quarks, the quarks they form a proton. And now basically um, what's happening is that I transfer a lot of energy to this quark which, uh, which is hit basically by the electron and then this flies away. Okay. Then the question is so, well, in the first instant can it fly away? Well, what would hinder it flying away? Well, if the interaction of this guy here with the other guys in the proton is strong, this would mean the whole proton would move, right? Because, I mean, if I, if I basically try to move this cup here, the interaction between all the atoms in here is so strong that, uh, I mean, in spite of the fact that I only touch a few of these atoms, all of them are moved. This is because the interaction of all them is, is, is strong. On the other hand, if I would hit the cup very hard, which I don't want to do, um, then maybe the interaction between the pieces in the cup is not strong enough and, and one part would be kicked out. This happens if the interaction is not strong. Well, this guy has a lot of energy. This I have ensured by hitting it hard. If it has a lot of energy, the interaction of this guy with the rest, if it would then scatter off the other constituents of the proton. Well, this is a high energy. This would be a high energy reaction. At high energies, however, the strong, so-called strong interaction is weak. So in other words, uh, these guys, they, they cannot hold that back. Or this guy cannot transfer much energy to these and carry them with it. That's the high energy part. So this makes sense from the point of view that alpha s is small. This is not a statement about this electromagnetic interaction. This is, in a sense, anyway small, but I mean, we only look at events where something is happening. I mean, all the events where the electron fails to meet the proton anyway, we do not consider. Okay, so this interaction is, is uh, this interaction strength, the electromagnetic is small, but we only look at the events where something is happening. But then the question is, um, what's happening now, most likely? Well, most likely, this guy here is very fast relative to that. To carry them along, it would have to transmit a lot of energy. But to do that, the coupling constant is small. Therefore, it does not happen very often. It happens to some extent, but we talk about now the most likely events. Good, okay, so we have kicked it out. So what's happening next? This, so far, is the high energy process. So 
So what's happening here, and that this really can move away from the others. This is the high energy part. Um, what did I call it here? Well, true high energy process. Um, However, now the quark tries to move away and tries to gain a lot of distance relative to the other guys. Well, this is something, um, I mean, if, if you have a large distance, at some point, uh, well, the typical interaction which, uh, the typical well, momentum range, which corresponds to large distances, or now small momenta. But at small momenta, the interaction is suddenly big again. Actually, what's physically happening is that you create new particles. And you create these new particles, first of all, because, well, A, it's possible, and this is what Einstein tells us, out of energy we can create new particles and B because it's actually cheap to do that and cheap means it happens very likely why is it cheap? I put in a lot of energy here producing new particles and you have seen how large the masses of uh, quarks are you have also seen there are a lot of uh, hadrons which have masses, well, around 1 GeV or below. Um, when I talk about high energy reactors here, I have in mind something like, uh, say, 10 or 100 GeV or 1 TeV, something what's happening. Well, this is not happening at LHC because they don't have an electron beam, but uh, I mean high energies. High energies compared to the typical masses of hadrons, not only to the quark masses, but even the hadron masses. Suppose now I have a very high energy and I use a little bit of that to create new particles. This would mean that the angle at which this guy is here leaving is not disturbed very much. You have a lot of, and this guy has a lot of energy and because of confinement actually it needs to invest a little bit of energy to produce new particles. Uh, but this does not disturb the flight direction very much. So actually what's now happening is that, um, so let me carry that on, that you produce Several particles, now this is, I mean, they are not produced out of nothing, but they are produced out of the energy which is here in the system. I could draw now a lot of gluon lines if I like, but actually this would be misleading because it's not governed by a pure perturbative picture where one has single gluons floating around. Um, so this series are meant to be something like quark, anti-quark, uh, Quark anti quark pairs created from the energy which is available, and you can create a lot of them here if the total energy available is big. <coughs> so, such states then would be mesons. Um, this here also would be a meson. This here would be a meson. And this here has three quarks, uh, so this here would be a baryon. <coughs> so this is a this is a low energy process in a sense that only a very very small part of the energy of the total available energy is used to produce these quark anti quark pairs. Um, well, but I can, uh, so, I mean, that's why it's called a low energy process, because it's only low energy. But this is enough then to have a couple of hadrons around. Um, <coughs> so this is a low energy. So 
quark anti quark pairs are produced. And they uh, form hadrons. <coughs> and the issue is that this does not cost much. available energy. <coughs> In a sense, um, now comes my argument why one can make use out of that. So let's look at the total process for a moment. So first of all, the energy, the electron hits something in the proton. We do not know how the proton, uh, how the quark momenta are distributed in the proton right from the start. This is a low energy thing. I mean, how many quarks do I have? How fast is this guy, say, relative to the other two, and so on? This is a low energy information. We do not get this from perturbative QCD, but no matter which scattering I do here, whether I use an electron or whether I use a neutrino, actually this also has been done, or whether I use a muon, or whether I scatter another proton, which I will do in a moment, how the quarks are distributed, I talk about this part now before one is hit, how they are distributed inside of the proton, this should always be the same. So if I get access to that once, ideally, I make one measurement and then I know it. And then for other reactions I can use this information. Now comes the second part, this electron hits a quark. This I know from QED. This is specific for this process, but it's something I know. And then comes the last part. I have a quark <laughs> flying away, and actually what's happening is that a lot of hadrons are produced finally. A quark flying away is also nothing specific for this process with the electron. If I find another way of letting it fly away, another way of giving a lot of energy to a single quark, then probably it will react in the very same way as here. So this part here is complicated, but does not depend on the production process. Again, if I can measure this once, I use this information for other experiments. This part here, the true high energy reaction, is process dependent, but calculable. And finally, the initial information, how are the quarks distributed in the proton, this is also something universal and should not depend on which process I look at. To make this clear, let me look at a second process, where a little bit more strong interaction plays a role. So example two is jet production. interesting to see how many hadrons are produced here. 
In principle, this is interesting, but maybe we cannot fully calculate that. However, from this picture, it should be clear that this part here does not really influence much what's happening here. Well, if this part here, which is low energy, does not influence the high energy process, it also means this does not have any influence on the scattered electron. And now suppose this is the only thing I'm measuring. I do a lot of experiments, scatter electrons and protons. I do not care whether in the end I get 5 hadrons, 10 or 100. I just add up all events. I mean, each single event is terribly complicated to describe, but all of them have one thing in common. When I add all of them, basically I wash out this information here, and the only thing what remains is that I have kicked out one quark, and I don't care what happens to it afterwards. And the message is, maybe I don't need to care about that, because this is a low energy part, this cannot drastically influence my high energy sub part. And then the only thing, so basically by adding up all events here, I can forget about what's happening to the right of my dotted line. And then the only thing I measure is this scattered off electron. And I deduce from that, well, essentially two informations, the scattering process and actually well, which quark in the proton uh, was hit in, which tells me about its momentum, and if I do these experiments a lot of times, it tells me about the momentum distributions of the quarks in the proton. So, having indeed here x and not something very specific like a proton and five pi ohms. But having anything, I basically get rid of this right-hand side here. And, so, and in other words, by I measure, I just care about the electron here. I have access on the scattering process, but the scattering process I know. This is QED. Um, so this I would basically do once and measure the charge of the quark. And actually, I mean... This fits very well to these values which I have given you, that an up quark has a charge two-thirds of a positron and a down quark minus one-third and so on. Um, so this all fits together. Um, so in a sense, this we have completely understood, which means if I measure this electron here, in the end, by knowing this process, I get information on the quark distributions in the proton. And this information is nothing I can calculate from QCD so far. But obviously how quarks are distributed in a proton has nothing to do with how I probe them. And that's why we do a second thing here. Um, so we go one step further. And instead of colliding something which we know, the electron, with the thing which we want to study, the proton, we now collide two similar things. Which, well, we both would like to study, uh, but already with the information which we have from deep inelastic scattering. <coughs> okay, so let's look at... I mean, I was here rather general, hadron-hadron collisions. In practice, these are again proton-proton collisions. One can also do, uh, one can create, for example, also pion beams, do pion-proton reactions, or, um, of course, one can also scatter on neutrons in a sophisticated way, or on nuclei. Um, but, okay, so I'm rather general here. Most of the reactors are brought on brought on actually. Okay, what's happening here? Well, um, so let me start again to be concrete with uh, something which looks like a proton. Start with three quarks. And, um, okay, now I want to picture it a little bit differently. Um, so I put some arrows for the reaction lines. 
So this is my hadron 1, which goes in that direction. <coughs> and I want to have um, a hadron here. So this is my hadron 2. And if I bombard them with high energy, um, well, actually, first of all, it's very likely that not so much is happening. That, in a sense, the quarks, they do not interact much if they have high relative momentum. Well, still, in a sense, you have kind of free quarks and they might rearrange uh, in a very different way. So, actually, if one collides hadrons with hadrons, what one sees is that afterwards are not the original hadrons left anymore, but a bunch of other hadrons, and they typically come out in forward direction. This was actually historically the first sign of having not so much interacting constituents inside of protons. Because think about the alternative. Suppose the proton, I mean, we know it has a a finite extension. Suppose it would be filled with an amorphous non-structure, jelly. Now suppose I, I collide two jelly objects with each other. I mean, typically this would smash out in all directions. Whereas if I have inside of my two hadrons more microscopic uh, objects like the quarks, I mean, they either scatter or they just pass through each other. Now, scattering, and this is what we describe here, would mean a high momentum transfer, so this is not very likely. So, the most likely thing is that they pass through each other, and then you would find something in the forward direction of your detectors. You would not find a lot of stuff here. Whereas, if it's jelly like, you find it more or less isotropically. Uh, distributed. So first of all, when people did such experiments, um, they were not sure what to expect. From electron-proton elastic scattering, they knew, well, the proton is an extended object. Okay, next test. What happens if I collide two extended objects? And it turns out that most of the uh, most of the products of the reaction ended up in forward direction. But there are also some events which um, are perpendicular to the beam direction. Um, and the interesting thing is that those one can describe by perturbative QCD. And this is what uh, one is after. So um, the corresponding picture is, is this here. So suppose these two guys here now Collide. This is now strong interaction, and the force carrier of a strong interaction are gluons, and I view them here by this curly line. So this here is a gluon. And what I have in mind now is I have a high momentum transfer, which means this guy here is, well, this guy here is kicked out, and this guy here is kicked out, whereas the rest uh, more or less continues. And now comes this hadronization process again. The same thing what's happening up here. I only need a little bit of energy to produce a lot of hadrons. <coughs> So here, out of this large amount of energy which I have, I produce a lot of uh, particles. So this here is a meson again now. Let me abbreviate this by M. This here is a meson. This here is not so nicely drawn, so this is a meson as well. This here, and this here is a baryon. And the same thing is happening here. So this is a baryon, this is a meson, meson.
So this is only a sketch. This can be also 10 mesons more um, or two less. <coughs> now let's compare the upper picture and the lower picture. Um, I have this by the way. So this goes in that direction and uh, this here flies off here and this flies out here and these guys go out here and this goes out here. <coughs> um, this here is supposed to be a hard process. So I would now like to look at the following final state in my experiment. A hard process transfers a lot of energy, which means this guy here, relative to the original beam line, will be more or less perpendicular. Same for this guy here. And you see, in the end, it is kind of dressed as a meson. Actually, physically, it's not one meson, but it's a bunch of particles traveling out perpendicular to the beam direction with a high momentum. And on the other side, 180 degrees away, I have also some bunch of particles traveling out to total with a high momentum. I have no telling what exactly this bunch of particles looks like, whether these are 10 pi ohms or 5 pi ohms and k ohms and so on. I don't know. I'm only interested in that something goes out with high momentum relative to the rest, well the rest you see down here, and on the other side also something going out with high momentum. And this will cause a two jet event. Spatial distribution for this ionization. So now you have now you have a new baryon, mm -hmm. um, and this is supposed to be an isotropic distribution. Then, or how, like how they how is this interacting with the the non the quarks that didn't interact? Like how do the the new quark pairs interact with them? These guys? Yeah. Um. Because I was imagining that the jet is very concentrated on the track of the, the scattered particles. And then suddenly, suddenly there's an interaction between them. I mean, the jet is what comes out. I, yeah. mean, the, I mean, here, of course, I mean, I mean, this guy would have the highest momentum. Because it inherits the momentum of the original quark. And, uh, I mean, this guy would also be in energy close by, because, I mean, out I mean, I only want to use a little bit of energy here and here to create these guys, so they don't have much relative momentum. Um, but of course, at some point, this is—I mean, this is going to the to the other end of this reaction, where these guys have, in the end, of course, a relative. I mean, they have. So these guys have a high momentum relative to the remnants here. And what one sees is actually a cone of, of fast particles and then a lot of soft background. So it's not that this is continuously distributed. I mean, this is something which uh, in this picture one cannot, one cannot see whether this is continuously now distributed or not. Actually, what's happening is that, that you have a bunch of particles, still this can be many, but they are distinct in their energy or in their momentum relative to all the rest. Okay, let me, let me compare this here to what we've seen up there. First, what you should see is the elementary high energy reaction is different. Here I have a reaction of two quarks exchanging a gluon, going out to two quarks. And up there we had an electron scattering on a quark. If this reaction is happening at high energy, which means if I, if I observe, finally, these two jets, 
If I observe that obviously I have transferred a lot of energy from one to the other, otherwise I would not have high energy particles flying out in directions different from the beam direction. Um, if this was the case, QCD perturbation theory should be applicable and I can calculate this process specific part with high accuracy. So this is process specific, different from there, but this I can calculate. What else enters then here? Well, the other thing is that I have here a hadron and one of the quarks is kicked. Here it's kicked by another quark, up there it's kicked by the electron. This distribution of the quarks inside of my hadron, if suppose this is the proton again, I mean this should be the same here and there. So this is a part which I cannot calculate from QCD, but I can try to parameterize that, for example, doing a deep inelastic scattering experiment with electrons at different scattering angles, and then I get the so-called parton distribution functions. This is how quarks are distributed inside of a proton. And I could use this information to describe this reaction here. Because this information here, what comes in, is the same as there. Then what scatters is different. But this part, the process dependent part, I can calculate. And then finally, what comes out? What comes out is again something which is soft. So the distribution of momenta of these guys here relative to the rest. This distribution is not disturbed much. It's essentially undisturbed by this final so-called hadronization process. In other words, one can try, so one, one selects these events where one sees chats. One does this very, very often, has very, very different angles where the chats go out with different probabilities, but all this should be given basically by perturbation theory. How the angles are distributed, how likely is it that these go out at 90 degrees or at a different angle and so on. Provided I look at these events where it's appropriate, at the events where I have two jets. And actually, um, this is one of the features of perturbative QCD that one can quantitatively describe the angular distribution of jet events. Now finally suppose a third thing. Um, in principle this guy being kicked hard could emit another gluon. It's not very likely that it emits a high energy gluon because this goes with alpha s and uh, alpha s is small, but I can look for such unlikely events. They are even more unlikely than the two jet events, but if these are the interesting ones, uh, then if I insist on that hard enough, my experimental friends would be willing to look for that. And this is what happened. So the theoreticians at some point said, the chat events are the things where we can try to understand what's going on. Where we can try to find the microscopic interaction uh, on which the strong interaction is based on, the microscopic theory. Um, and then, I mean, experimentalists were looking for these rare events where one had two chats, and they also looked for rare events where one had three chats. And three chats in this picture one can only get by basically emitting off one more gluon such that, well, this guy which has emitted it is still hard, has still high momentum, and also the gluon has high relative momentum to what it was emitted from. So if I have a lot of energy, of course, I can also distribute it over three particles and not only over two plus a soft rest. So I was looking also for three jet events, and again for the angular distributions of three particles, of not three particles, of three jets 
all of them carrying a couple of particles, but distinct by their, the whole thing, the whole jet is distinct by momentum from the rest. And actually one can even look for four jets and five jet events. Um, the calculations become more and more complicated. The experimental way of discriminating then jets from the rest becomes also, of course, more and more complicated. Um, but two and three jet events are extremely well understood, to some extent also four jet events. And from that understanding, this was crucial to say we think we have with QCD the right uh, interaction. Because um, in a sense you do not see this quark as a single quark in the detector, but if you have a jet of particles which is, has very high energy, it emerges originally from one quark. And therefore one, see, one says, by seeing a jet, I see to some extent the quark, or I can trace back that there was originally one single quark being hit very hard. And from three jet events, one then says in the same way, one sees the gluons. Because a three jet event in QCD, one can only understand, I always produce normally a particle and an antiparticle, so I could not produce here a quark without an antiquark, uh, but I, I can create one gluon. I can have a quark and then this splits into a quark and a gluon. That's fine. So a three jet event um, in the language of QCD can only mean I have a hard quark, a hard antiquark and one hard gluon. Um, of course the issue is not that just theoreticians claim, well, when you see a three-chat event, uh, hey, here you have your gluon. Now believe that one of them is microscopically a gluon. That's not how science works. I mean, the theoreticians made solid predictions. There will be three-chat events with this and that probability, and the angular distribution of the three chats relative to each other, relative to the beam line, uh, this is predicted. And all this agrees to a fantastic extent with what uh, the experiments have shown. And only then one was convinced we have seen gluons in the sense that we have seen a jet which could only emerge from originally a gluon. So in spite of the fact that no one has seen in a detector a single gluon or a single quark, these two and three jet events are taken as, as, a, as a proof that microscopically there are quarks and gluons. Um, time for a break, I would say. Then uh, we come back quarter. We come back quarter past uh, two. Uh, half past two. Half past two. Be one minute. Uh, half past two. Okay. <laughs> Since we do something very modern here with the, with the camera, I thought I also do something very old-fashioned and use this, uh, this old-fashioned projector. So this is now nothing deep, but I just would like to show you that what I claimed here is also experimentally, experimentally seen. And since I have uh, found these slides from one of my lectures 10 years back or something like that, um, I thought I'd show you that uh, as a reminiscence to the old times of, of these uh, overhead projectors. So this is actually something which has been measured uh, at CERN by the Olaf experiment. Do we have a pointer here? Um, no. um, and what you are supposed to see here are, uh, are two jets. So whatever is yellow here, the whole thing is a jet. And the other thing, what you see here are some dots. Uh, uh, so all this is stuff which is, which has 
by far less energy than these yellow guys together. So it's not that one of these yellow lines is the jet, but this, this whole thing, this here is a jet. And on the other side, you see the second jet. And um, let's for a moment think that this picture of these quarks is not true. I mean, then you still might think, okay, I can kick out something, but maybe on the other side, the rest, behaves completely different. Maybe I produce one jet, and on the other hand side I produce a lot of stuff which has medium energy, not too high, not too low. This would not fit to my picture at all. My picture is completely symmetric. I have I had two quarks hitting, and then of course both do very similar things. What they do in detail, how many mesons are formed here and so on, this is complicated. But roughly they should do the same thing, and you see that here. They do the same thing. One flies out here, the other here. Um, so, I mean, this is of course now only qualitative arguments that this fits to our picture. It becomes quantitative when we do a lot of such events and see how is the angular distribution. How likely is it that we come out here relative, well, because this is your rotational symmetric, but that they, they come out with a certain angle the beam line is, is here, by the way, that they come out with a certain angle to the beam line, um, and then is the other one also going with the opposite angle and so on. And this is all true. And it's, uh, I mean, one can, get, one can get this quantitatively how the jets are distributed. What one cannot get is what do the jets in detail consist of? All these leading particles, say the most energetic ones, are these pions or are these actually protons or whatever? This is complicated. But if one adds all of these events up, no matter what they consist of, QCD gives a very good description of angular distributions and the likeliness that this is happening. So um, this is the two jet picture, and there is also three jet events. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, QCD makes two qualitative statements first. Um, a, this is less likely than the other one. This is also a, a message um, because you had to emit an additional gluon. And again, the angular distribution one can predict. And there is no one jet event. This is what I said first. Um, so there are two jets less likely three jets, even less likely four jets, um, and, um, well, one can understand the angular distribution. And again here, I mean, the green stuff is, is uh, much less in energy, so the experimentalists around you, I mean, they understand this anyway, there is a magnetic field here and the particles are, bend, are bending, and if they have uh, high momentum, they bend less, which means, I mean, the yellow stuff is, is nearly straight lines, uh, whereas the green stuff is bending much, so their energy, their momentum is, is much smaller. Um, and this is at so high energies that the mass actually does not matter whether the mass is a little bit bigger or smaller. The, the momentum is the dominating thing here. <coughs> So, so the A, uh, you see this was the old way of uh, presenting stuff. Funny that this still works. Um, B, also before LHC, at CERN, uh, very important experiments were made. Um, not only at CERN, of course, not only there, but uh, CERN was also a major player in, uh, I mean, Figuring out uh, well these that these two chat events, three chat events, that all this fits together with QCD. Um, the four chat events are actually also interesting because only there the gluon gluon interaction plays an important role. And uh, I mean they are less likely, so they are harder and harder to get. But um, we will. We will see later on that QCD is, is based on a, on a specific uh, group structure. 
And in the beginning, when uh, Gell-Mann, for example, formulated his um, eightfold way and how the quark model works and so on, also to this we will come, uh, it was not clear what is the group structure of quarks of, and the interactions of quarks and the, what quarks build up. Um, so there were several group, groups in the game um, and it's actually not so simple to discriminate these if one does not have uh, access to the gluon gluon interactions. And these four chat events were very important to, to really pin down, yes, we now have also, um, I mean, we have some information on, on really the group structure which is behind these interactions. I will come back to that when we talk about the group structure. And I can show some more, some more pictures um, <coughs> from experimental results that uh, we really have the right theory there. Um, not only roughly the right ideas. Um, good. Any more questions? Uh, I mean, this was more concerning the, the asymptotic freedom part and where our trust comes from, the QCD is the right theory. Um, for today, I mean, the topic was uh, a little bit on a lower level uh, that I want to, that you get reminded on some issues from analytical mechanics and uh, some basics of quantum field theory, what are Lagrangians, how uh, does one describe uh, various theories. Are there questions concerning this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so for the PDFs, uh, are there any methods to produce them, to motivate them theoretically, or all are them? Yeah, um, so the PDFs for the, for the non-experts, these are the, the part of distribution functions, so this gives information how are quarks, and also what you can excite when you look at that, how are anti-quarks and gluons, I mean, after all, all this is there inside of a proton if one looks deeper and deeper. Uh, all this one calls parton distribution functions. Uh, so the question is, I mean, does QCD say anything about that? And um, so first of all, um, the I mean, in my first lecture, I tried to distinguish a little bit between model building and, say, the hard QC defects. I would say, I mean, historically, in the beginning, uh, I mean, it was clear, well, this here is perturbative, we can calculate. This distribution is low energy, probably we cannot. We, first of all, try to measure it, mainly by... Uh, by these deep and elastic scattering reactions. And then, of course, once one measured that, people started out uh, trying to model it. Based on the idea, well, of course, these are quarks. What do quarks do? Hmm, they are confined in a bag. So, for example, there is a so-called bag model, which uh, is not QCD, but which tries to model the most important features, like that quarks basically cannot go away f very far from each other. Uh, modeling that in a very simple way, uh, one gets, I would say, a not so bad uh, description of part of distribution functions. Typically only of part of it, not of, of uh, all of them, uh, but some you get fairly well. I mean, one should not get the feeling that this is the last answer, because it's a model after all and one compares to experiments, uh, which also, of course, have their uncertainties. Then one started uh, looking at parton distribution functions with lattice QCD. So lattice QCD will also come in these lectures. That's a, um, a way of well, basically taking QCD as it is, uh, discretizing the world, discretizing the continuum, space and time, um, and then more or less solving the QCD equations on a grid. And one can do that 
for this part of distribution functions to some extent. And this, I mean, I would say the, the situation there, I mean, this is clearly better than modeling. But, I mean, Lattice QCD also has to deal with some approximations and, um, and in part it's not so clear how to control the errors. And uh, this, I would say the status of having pattern distributions from Lattice QCD is more that the Lattice QCD people regard it as a test of their methods whether what they get agrees with experiment. So it's not, they are, they are not on a level where they would predict the pattern distributions, uh, but rather on a level where they try to get it at, as good as possible and if it agrees they are happy. Uh, so it's more a post-diction than a prediction at the moment. I think it's fair to say that. Uh, I'm sure if we talk about that in 50 years, uh, I mean lattice QCD will be much better and uh, and have uh, much more access to pattern distributions. Um, you should see, I mean, when I talk about how is something distributed, of course, this is not a number now, this is a function. So what is the, the fraction of a quark uh, that it takes, or how likely is it that a quark takes a tenth of the proton momentum? Questions like that. So one talks about distributions, one talks about functions, and uh, I mean, lattice QCD can then give something for a specific range of these functions. Uh, so this also has to do then with the, uh, with the grid distance and the resolution scale and so on. So we would never expect that lattice gives something for the whole distribution functions, but uh, probably they are getting better and better for more, for a a broader range in the, say, the momentum range between this quark carries nothing from the proton momentum to this quark carries nearly everything, so from zero to one. Somewhere are the lattice results already quite okay, and somewhere uh, we still have to wait for a long time until they get there. Probably at at low at low momentum, um, I would guess. This is very sensitive to what's happening at high energies, which um, needs a very, very fine resolution, which lattice probably does not have nowadays. So that's that's one of the typical things I would say, where it's in principle straightforward to attack that by lattice QCD, uh, but in practice, uh, one still has to wait for a while until until very good predictions come. Um, so at the moment, this is on a, in a stage where a lot of model building is, is still important. Um, and I said that already uh, in, the, in the first meeting, these models are, are bad in a sense that it's not the final answer, it's not a first principle thing. On the other hand, they are sometimes very good to, to guide qualitatively what is important and what is not so important. And this can also be relevant for lattice, actually. In spite of the fact that one has the feeling lattice is a first principle calculation, uh, still sometimes the uncertainties are much better to control in these calculations if one has from a model an idea what is important and what is not. I will, I mean, when I talk about lattice, I will come back to that. I'm not sure. I mean, if you want, I can dig out also some lattice calculation of the pattern distributions. There are other things where one can see, in my opinion, better that, uh, well, which input one needs for lattice and which uh, one does not, and, and where, where everything comes out automatically. So I would say the, the issue still is, uh, it's important uh, to get this from experiment, one cannot predict it from first principles yet, and uh, well, and there are, for some aspects, quite good models, which have the usual problem that one does not know how to improve models systematically, how one can get a handle on the uncertainties and so on. So it's more on the level, well, we have data, 
then people develop models which describe the data, then they are happy, <laughs> and then they make predictions, uh, and then sometimes we have new data where the model disagrees, and uh, Theron has to refine things. Um, so at some point we would like to do this on a more systematic level, and we are not there yet. Other questions? You said earlier that the lattice QC could only calculate uh, static properties, but the part of distribution function sound quite dynamic. Yeah, I was fearing that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> one can. There are quantities which indeed sound dynamic, but which one can. Which one can formulate so often that in the end it boils down to a static uh, question. And I would say even for me it is hard to see right from the start which quantities are which. It does not work for every quantity. Um, there are some things which one first of all would think you never get this from lettuce, but nowadays one actually can get it. Uh, but it's still true that one cannot get everything. Um, to be honest, for the bottle distributions, I, 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 I mean, I know that this is done on the lattice. And, I mean, if they start doing it, they do something reasonable. It's not that they just do something which is, which is nonsense because one never can get that. Uh, but I never looked into that what exactly they did. In that sense, I cannot tell you how to circumvent this dynamical problem. But you are right. I mean, this sounds like a um, yeah. It sounds like a dynamic quantity. I agree. Um, and funnily, it's not. And uh, yeah, yeah. I cannot say more at the moment. Okay. But I, I mean, I can, I can figure that out. I would, um, I mean, anyway, we are close to the end. Uh, at the moment, I mean, those of you who went through the lecture notes a little bit might have seen, I mean, there is nothing in there concerning pattern distributions and so on. If, I mean, if most of you have the feeling that, uh, um, that this is something interesting, for sure we have time in these lectures that we go into that. So, um, still I think it is, it is a good structure that we first get the, the basics clear, uh, that first you see the QCD Lagrangian at some point and uh, we discuss symmetries and so on. Um, and then at some point, uh, which then rather I would like to define than, <laughs> than you, uh, at some point, then I would uh, ask you, or I will ask you, so in the future I will ask you at some point, should we go more into this or that? And, and uh, ex explicitly I offer to you uh, that we can go into more these high energy things, uh, pattern distributions. And for example, I mean the pattern distributions are actually the low energy part of the high energy things. You know, because this is, I mean, this part here. Um, but of course, this is related to the high energy reactions. So we can do that. Uh, I mean, this is one interesting part of QCD. Um, as it is designed at the moment, it focuses more on the low energy aspects. Um, because I think the low energy aspects are, are much less settled. And so there is much more present day research. Um, well, one knows much less there, so it's it's nice to do, to develop some tools there which are accurate and from which one can deduce something. And, and this is what these effective field theories are about. But this does not mean that uh, that it's necessary that, that we fill half of the lectures with these effective field theories and low energy QCD, but we can add or throw out part of that and um, add some more high energy things in which would uh, 
which yeah, which mainly would concentrate on these um, yeah, bottom distribution functions. This interplay again here between high and low energy physics, uh, what one can calculate, what one cannot, and um, yeah, and and also bring in this lattice thing for bottom distributions. I mean, think about that. I mean, this is fine, uh, but this will be an issue more than in, in say in two weeks or, or something. I think it would be misplaced here now because I mean, here I want to give you a qualitative picture. Uh, then we go through the theory, not on the level of doing detailed calculations, but that you see how the Lagrangian is constructed, what are the symmetries and so on, uh, what one can learn from that, and, and then we can together decide in which direction we want to go, or where, where we put more, where we spend more time. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. I have a question about this uh, Lagrangian. Uh, you have Lagrangian for two, two uh, uh, scalar fields, two boson fields, uh, phi 1 and phi 2. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, make this new, yeah, take li linear combination of the phi and phi dagger. Uh -huh. And you say you can treat them as independent variables. Right. Uh, and, and it's like you then do that and you, you see that you get the same result, so it was okay to treat it as linear, uh, as independent variables. Mm -hmm. But are there like any other arguments for that or how is the thinking? Well, I mean, if, if, I mean, not much more than what I, what I have written here. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a complex valued object, yeah. I mean, this has a real and an imaginary part. So, in a sense, the real and imaginary part, they are independent degrees of freedom, if you want, in that sense. And whether I take the real and imaginary part or any linear combinations thereof, I mean, this is completely my choice, right? I mean, as long as, I mean, I, by taking linear combinations, I just rearrange things, I do not delete any information. Um, and, and the linear combinations then I would say are real part plus i times imaginary part and real part minus i times imaginary part and these two are as independent as real and imaginary part. I mean this is the issue. Mm, okay. I, I mean with, by linear combinations I do not get rid of, of any information. I mean this is my statement. But but it's like a complex conjugate. I, for me, it feels like if you have the one, then you get the other one directly. And, and That's true, but this means when you have one, you already have the two informations, the real and the imaginary part. Yeah, okay. Um, I think it's always a little bit... Uh, it's a little bit tricky, this, the, the basic idea which is behind this variational method of, I mean, already in mechanics, this has nothing to do with field theory now. I mean, one looks, how should I say it? I mean, of course, nature, um, I mean, nature does something. A process is happening according to the laws of nature. Um, and we describe that by, say, a path, some, so we have uh, one dimension, uh, we have, say, one degree of freedom, so we would describe its motion by, say, its uh, generalized coordinate as a function of time. Okay, and if we have several degrees of freedom, we take more than one coordinate. Um, of course, there is only one path, there is only one coordinate as a function of time, for a given function of time, it always has a certain value in nature. Now I construct from that a Hamiltonian and I construct from that a Lagrangian. And then comes the abstract step. I consider this Lagrangian, if I take it literally with this path, it's a number. But now the abstract step is, I take this Lagrangian 
as a functional of this specific coordinate, which in turn is a function of time. And I assume that this has arbitrary values. That this coordinate can take on for a given time arbitrary values. And now in this principle of minimal action, I look for these specific values as a function of time where my action is minimal. Which means I allow for unphysical variations. Right? I mean, if I just stick in my physical path, I just get a number for the action. I would, I can, if I just get a number, I cannot tell whether this is a minimum. I mean, it is a minimum in the space of, in a sense, unphysical values for my coordinate. I allow for arbitrary values for a given time, and then do an integration, calculate the action, and so on. Um, and then I compare for each First of all, unphysical value uh, or, or unphysical function. I compare which of them gives me a minimum. This is the one which nature has chosen. In that sense, I mean, what you have in mind, now coming back to your question, of course, once I get my function, now a complex valued field, once I have the real and imaginary part, I have everything. But in the variation, I have to allow for arbitrary deviations. And, and formally, it makes sense to, to treat in this variation principle the phi and the phi dagger as independent from each other. Forgetting for a moment that they, of course, depend on each other in the sense that uh, if I have phi, I should get phi dagger. But this is, in a sense, already the the result of my calculation, if you want. The result of the calculation. Okay. So, so it's like you begin like you see two different values. Yes. I, I, I mean, formally, I treat them as if they really have nothing to do with each other. Right. Um, however, with yeah, yeah, essentially that's it. I mean, as if they have nothing to do with each other. But it turns out in the end uh, and that anyway the the equation of motion my phi satisfies is the complex conjugate to the equation of motion my phi dagger satisfies. Um, so I think the best way to view it is uh, I start with boundary conditions where my phi and my phi dagger are complex conjugate to each other. I mean, this is my input. And I have a Lagrangian which is constructed such that it's real value. I mean, this I also need. And I want, by the way, a, a real value Lagrangian because then my Hamiltonian is real valued, and the Hamiltonian should be real valued because these are the energies. Uh, and if I quantize it, whatever I said with real now is replaced by Hermitian. And if the Hamiltonian was not Hermitian, uh, then its eigenvalues would not be real, and this is unphysical. The Hamiltonian should have real eigenvalues which I can observe as energies. So anyway. Having real energies requires Hermitian Hamiltonian, requires Hermitian Lagrangian, requires in a sense that if I have my phi and my phi dagger as independent variables, at least they should they should be combined such that afterwards, if they become the complex conjugate to each other, the Lagrangian is real. Okay, so for a moment I forget that phi. I get phi dagger from phi by daggering. Uh, uh, but I mean, if the relation is such, then the Lagrangian should be real, okay? But now I forget about all that. I have my Lagrangian. Now I treat phi and phi dagger as completely independent, just with the boundary conditions that they are complex conjugate. And in a sense, now I explore all possible variations that the phi can be anything and say the phi dagger zero. That's fine. Okay, I'm really, I mean, I'm willing to explore everything to find the minimum, and then the rest I'm not interested in. But the minimum actually uh, again then satisfies this condition that phi is the complex conjugate of phi dagger, and it does it because my Lagrangian was constructed such. So I put that in. I mean, it's not that this magically comes out. Um, but in this variation principle, I, I can explore all possibilities.
And this is, um, I mean, I cannot prove to you why this is a good way of doing that. But I mean, I tried to, with my, yeah. uh, with my decomposition into real and imaginary power, I, I mean, I, I tried to explain why this is a good idea to do it that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, in principle, I could imagine also having just a variation I mean, not in this whole space of arbitrary phi and phi dagger, but keeping on this line where phi is really the complex conjugate to phi dagger, uh, which would be a subspace of the whole space of possibilities. Um, I think that one would not get the right equations out, but I have not uh, completely looked at that. Um, but for the variation principle, one really lifts these constraints, uh, explores everything, and in the end, uh, I mean, you, you take what you get from the variation principle. Thank you. Uh, three o'clock, and it's half a holiday today, I have learned. So, um, anyway, thanks for coming. And uh, we see you.